panel on computing and the brain. I'm Sanjeev Arora from Princeton and I'll be the moderator and I'll briefly introduce a panel. Uh, Shafi Golwasa from MIT. Uh, she's like me a theoretical computer scientist and interested in theories of the brain. Jan Lacun, uh, the famous person who brought us deep nets. Um, uh, Bruno Olshausen. Oh I see they are out of order. Uh, uh, Bruno, uh, Bruno Olshausen. Um, a neuroscientist who has also uh, explained neural algorithms. Uh, Pietro Perona uh, ha is an expert in vision and uh, uh, especially in uh, uh, flies and other, uh, other small animals. Um, and Les Valiant uh, is another theoretical computer scientist who I think of as a meta thinker. He's come up with interesting theories about all kinds of things uh, from a comp computational perspective. Uh, so the uh, questions I posed to the panel was, uh, they, were, they fall under three categories. Can study of algorithms, AI slash intelligence systems guide theories of the brain? So we have s several experts here uh, who, are, uh, 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 who are working in AI intelligence systems so, uh, and algorithms. So uh, what can that study tell us about the brain? Um, I, I asked them to uh, comment on uh, on the data collection aspect <coughs> of neuroscience, you know, this, uh, the net being thrown uh, out uh, to use uh, uh, the, the terminology of the previous speaker. So is connectomics the key? And what advances in computing are needed for connectomics and, and, other, uh, uh, another, uh, and other areas of uh, neuroscience? And finally, can study of brain or attempts at study of brain radically change computing efficiency, scale, et cetera? So those were the three types of questions. Uh, so the, uh, the way the panel is uh, structured, I requested everybody to prepare like five, six slides uh, and talk for five to seven minutes about uh, where they're coming at, uh, where they're coming from at this question. Um, I'll run it roughly alphabetical order, which is convenient. So, uh, so you you get to see a little bit about what the sorry, right. So, <laughs> oh, I see, alphabetical order, right? <laughs> theorists, right, what Chris shows me is that theorists uh, order the authors of a paper in alphabetical order. So, um, all right, so, uh, and, uh, so I'll just uh, start with a few slides, then we won't have to change the computer. Um, okay. Uh, all right, so, uh, so yeah, we are interested in this object uh, today. And, and, uh, <laughs> sorry? Backwards. Backwards, sorry. Is it? How did that happen? Oh my goodness, okay, <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Okay, uh, I did some uh, key command and it flipped. Okay, uh, so, but as a computer scientist, I think uh, maybe this is the more interesting object, which I call the super brain, you know, which is what we computer scientists are building. So yes, uh, you know, I love uh, life sciences and it's great the, the uh, the amount of progress that has been made in understanding those. But, you know, when I think about my own life, right, my interactions with medical technology, you know, is eyeglasses, which is many centuries old. I broke a bone and it was set, or, you know, had a wound and was stitched that was thousands of years old, that technology. So it hasn't really affected my life so much. Whereas this, or everything around it, you know, is completely transforming our life. So I would actually predict that advances in computing, you know, this external intelligence to us, which is not constrained by our silly biological limitations, is probably the m dominant uh, progress that will be made in the next century. That's just a prediction. Um, and so, uh, so, so yeah, so uh, I'm interested in, in neuroscience, but I think at the back of the mind, uh, I'm thinking that there's a lot of interesting things that could come out for computer science from this study. And, and of course, Jan's work is an example of that. Uh, so uh, I'm a theorist and I'm interested in uh, computational complexity and algorithms. And it turns out there's something going on that's maybe analogous to uh, what happens in physics, that the, the field races ahead and the math is left, you know, has to struggle to catch up, you know. Uh, and usually the math is 50 years behind where the, where the field is. And it's something similar is going on with machine learning. 
uh, which of course probably everybody in this room has used. And uh, the question for math and theory of CS here is, uh, why does it work? Okay, and uh, the, the function is highly nonlinear, non-convex, especially in settings of unsupervised learning. Basically everything you saw in today's talks was, was of this nature. And the algorithm people are using is simple gradient descent, and that cannot work, right? I mean, that picture shows it, right? Gradient descent should not work, but it does. So, uh, so this is a big mystery uh, uh, for me. And, uh, and I think <coughs> studying this more can certainly help uh, computer science uh, because uh, uh, possibly this is what's done in, in nature as well, including the brain, and somehow it does solve real life problems. Okay, so all these uh, machine learning techniques uh, have this as uh, this idea, simple gradient descent on a non-convex function as a basic uh, technique and somehow it works. Okay, so that's very interesting to me. And so I've been uh, working on trying to explain that in some simple settings. So what the simplest setting in, in the study of the brain is maybe the study of V1. And there, there's this uh, idea of sparse coding by Bruno and, uh, and Field. Um, and why does that work? Okay, so remember sparse coding is that you take image patches and you train this very simple uh, one level network uh, uh, and uh, it's called dictionary learning or sparse coding and it comes up with these filters, okay? And, uh, and it's plausibly an explanation for what's going on in V1 or at least part of it. And it, it's, it has lots of applications in computer science. So this is an example of how a simple idea from neuroscience has had lots of applications in uh, in computer science. Okay, so uh, here the algorithm that uh, Bruno and his co-author suggested was this energy minimization heuristic, which has been suggested as a general guiding principle for the brain. That the reason the brain is organized the way it is is because it's trying to minimize energy uh, consumption. So this is uh, energy minimization heuristic. The energy function is, you know, you're trying to represent the, the vectors that you're given, the data that you're given in some neural code, B times X, X is sparse, and uh, sparsity is an energy constraint, and also you're trying to minimize this, this uh, reconstruction error. And it's some gradient descent algorithm, uh, which can be implemented on, on a neural architecture. Why does this work? So, uh, so uh, recently we showed that under some plausible assumptions, these heuristics actually find the global optimum. Okay, so even though it's non-convex, there's, you know, you can do math here and you can prove optimality, okay, of this simple algorithm. So that's just an example of the kinds of things I'm interested in. Another one is uh, deep nets as generative or predictive models. So this is again an idea that I, I believe came out of neuroscience that the brain is not only a feed forward device that's transforming the input to higher order representations, but it sort of converts those higher order uh, representations to something low order and validates what it's thinking about. So that, uh, that, the, that there's some kind of a generative process in the mind uh, which approximates reality. Okay, and so, so in the deep net setting, reversing the deep nets gives an approximate generated model for the in input distribution. So Hinton called this, called this restricted Boltzmann machines. Uh, Lacun calls it reconstruction error. Benjo calls it denoising order encoders, et cetera. And this is again very mysterious and then we thought about it a fair bit and we realized that at least in the setting where the deep net is a sparse random graph, each level is a sparse random graph with random synap synapses. So this is just the beginning of a theory. I'm not saying this happens in the brain that it's a sparse random graph with random synapse weights. But if, it, if that is the case, then by looking at the distribution, you can learn it in problem mode. Okay, so I'll uh, stop there and I'll uh, uh, hand it over to uh, Shafi. Okay, hi. So <coughs> when uh, Sanjeev, uh, or I think Christus is actually the guilty one, uh, put me on this panel and Sanjeev uh, asked the questions, um, uh, sort of what are the connection between uh, what we can do for neuroscience and what neuroscience can do for us. And us here means TOC, that's theory of compu computing. Um, I, um, I came up with a few ideas. <laughs> so first of all, it's clear that there's beautiful modeling and questions in mathematics that can come up with and people have been working with. The question really is what is the impact uh, that we can make on the progress of neuroscience? Or, so uh, in other words, Certainly there are beautiful modeling questions and papers that we can write. But the question is, what does ha that have to do with, with neuroscience? So there's a question mark there, but at the end of the talk, I'll have the same slide without the question mark. Because uh, <laughs> having spent a half a day here, I'm convinced that maybe we can make some impact on the neuroscience. So that was uh, quick. Um, okay, so 
back to theoretical computer science, uh, you know, we, uh, we we believe that we found uh, uh, we found out some very interesting ideas about computation in terms of how to model computation, what complexity measures are important, space, time, size of the machine, uh, the, uh, the, the importance of randomization, synchronization, parallelism, error correction, fault tolerance, locality. So these are things that theoretical computer science talk about and uh, study and, uh, and love. And, and I think obviously it's a very interesting question where uh, how to ask the same questions about the brain. You know, what kind of computer is going on there? What should you measure about it? it is there randomization going on? Is there synchronization and so forth? And I think from that point of view, the theory of computer science gains to benefit a beautiful theories. Uh, there's another um, way to look at it, and that is that uh, besides these sort of fundamental kind of higher principles that we should study about the brain, uh, we can think of um, ourselves as assisting neuroscientists, okay? So here I want to think about algorithms. Rather than principles of sort of randomness, uh, parallelism, and so forth, I want to think of what kind of algorithms have we developed, or what kind of algorithmic paradigms have been developed by theoreticians, by theoretical computer scientists, that might be useful for neuroscientists. Uh, and I'd like to talk about that. So most of my talk will be about how can we use some of the algorithmic methods that we have developed or are developing in order to analyze data that's collected by neuroscientists. So this is really, you know, Jeff's talk. Uh, so there is this connectomics, there's all this data that's being collected, it will be collected, and the question is, is there something that we can uh, say? Is there something that we can help with that? And um, so very quickly, I want to go to the question of graphs. So uh, graph theory is one of these uh, areas of computer science and mathematics and uh, combinatorics where there's been tremendous progress over the last whatever, 40, 50 years, and it's, a, it's an extremely lively community that, with very smart people. But classically, those graphs are not the same as what is coming up, because there's just the sheer size is very different, right? So the kind of graph questions and algorithms that we have come up with are wonderful, but not for the size of graphs that are coming up uh, in the internet, in the brain graph, transistors on a chip, when we're talking about billions of nodes. And uh, that means, uh, so the size here means that we have to ask, it drives what questions we ask and also how we answer them. So first of all, let's talk about the questions, okay? So why does the size of the graph change the kind of questions that we should be asking? Uh, the size and the type of graph. So for example, a natural question you might ask on a classical graph is, um, you know, is there a node of odd degree, you know, or how many nodes of odd degrees are there? I don't know if it's a very interesting question, but it's a natural question. But that question makes no sense for something like the Bain graph or is a particular node of odd degree, because things keep changing all the time. So the edges, this is not a static graph, right? The edges, they come, they go. Um, it doesn't make any sense as a question, but you know, a question that does make sense might be, you know, what is the average degree uh, of a node, or average degree of a node in this graph? So the type of questions we ask, first of all, have to be uh, different, because this is not a static object, but it's more of a dynamic object. Second kind of question that's very natural for a classical graph is, is it connected? Okay, so again, that's kind of a stupid question in your context because obviously it's not connected. Um, so why ask it? But you can ask an approximation of this question. So uh, that is, uh, what is it, and, and you have to define, what does it mean as good as connected? How close to connected it is? How many connected components are there? So those are the kind of questions we could ask about maybe brain graphs, which would be interesting um, to find the answers for. Or, and there's some other examples here of questions which make a lot of sense for classical graphs they don't necessarily make sense for brain graphs. So we have to ask new questions. Um, so for example, what is a typical subgraph? It's something that you talk a lot in graph theory. So there's a complete uh, graph of a certain size, there's a star a subgraph, and so forth. Um, you know, the brain graphs, you know, they have weights, I guess, the edges. It ch you know, what is a typical subgraph? Is it new, it's a new, new question. What, what, how do we translate that to the kind of graphs that would come up from the data that Jeff and, and others are collecting? All right, so first of all, uh, I think we should think about what to ask. Second question is, how do we even obtain this information? So again, uh, what I mean obtain by information, I don't mean just data collecting, you know, writing down the graph, but actually computing these properties, like how many connected components are there, you know, the diameter and so forth. These are computational questions. So for classical graph theory, you have the whole graph, right? That's the input. Obviously, that's not gonna work. So we, these graphs are too big. So the, you know, we're never gonna have the whole graph. Uh, in mo it's not even well-defined. But, um, so we have to think about how to f 
ask, answer these computational questions by some indirect method, you know, by sampling these graphs, uh, maybe by monitoring certain parameters over time. And the good news, okay, is that actually there's a lot of research that's been done in the last, I don't know, 15 years or something on graph algorithms uh, which actually derive properties of very large graphs from sampling small subgraphs. This is an area called property testing uh, where you have, you don't look at the entire object, so you don't look at the entire graph, but you can, let's say, sample neighborhoods. And there are different ways to sample neighborhoods. You could, uh, let's say, in the case of dense graphs, you could just take a subgraph, okay, and look at it. Um, and, that def and let's say that you, you sort of count how many times you see subgraphs of certain types. That will give you some probability distribution on these kind of subgraphs. And, um, and that sometimes is enough information to determine some global parameters of the graph. That's very interesting. I think in the context of uh, these huge brain graphs, that has got to be crucially relevant. Uh, now, if the graph is sparse and not, and not dense, you know, our methods are not as good, but we do have methods. Um, and obviously, at the end, we get approximate answers. We don't have an, an exact answer. Mm -hmm. So we have an answer to, for some graph that approximates the brain graph. So we need to come up with measures of how, graphs, how close is one graph to the other. So if it's approximate, we're talking about distances between graphs, we need to be able to measure that, right? Is it the number of edges that's different, the number of, you know, the weights, whatever. But we have to come up with these measures. So I have just two more slides, don't worry. Um, so the, you know, the, um, there's a good question here. A, I just said that we have good algorithms for dense graphs and not so great algorithms for, for bounded degree graphs. Okay, but what is, which one is the brain graph? You know, is it, uh, is it dense? Is it bounded degree? Is it a random graph? Uh. So Jeff's talk, he was saying that some of the observations they found indicates that this is not a random graph. Okay, so a very interesting question is, what is the right model? It's not a random graph. Uh, some other models that people have used in theoretical computer science is something called uh, randomly growing, um, these uh, uh, randomly growing graphs. So in other words, this is, there's some local rules which are random rules, and uh, that's a, that is how the graph supposedly has been generated, and there's some theorems that have been proved that as, as you go in time, this eventually converges to some kind of fixed structures, even though the, the local rules were random. You know, then you could think about quasi-random models. So there are different m models here that you could consider and prove properties with this uh, and run algorithms with respect to these models. So I have uh, uh, very proud of myself because I wrote this talk while I was here, um, <laughs> but you know, that probably means that one should question it. In any case, I do think that these are interesting questions for theoretical computer science, and that is um, uh, how about studying graph algorithms for weighted large brain graphs? So in other words, uh, Jeff was saying that uh, he collected this data in this big database, and then they noticed that there is a lot of dendrites and ax axons, am I getting the words right, that connect more so than it should be in a random graph. So that's, and then I asked him at lunch, how did they notice that? So he says, it's just, we noticed it by hand. You know, we saw it, and then we n validated it. That was true for all the data that we collected. So that's wonderful, but you know, doesn't that sound incredibly primitive? So uh, not to, you know, <laughs> so in other words, there are other things that mathematicians, theoretical computer science have learned about graphs, parameters of graphs that's supposed to be true for random graphs and not supposed to be true for quasi-random graphs. So that would be wonderful if we could find out whether these parameters, what are they? What is their value for these brain graphs? And then we could make some conclusions about whether this was a random graph, a quasi-random graph, generated by some simple rules and so forth. So here I think we, we have some, you know, there's no reason why we can't make progress. Um, and uh, therefore, my last slide is that there is no question mark. I think we can have impact. Whether we will have impact, that is a different question. Thank you. Yeah. All right, pleasure to be here. Um, so um, uh, as someone who's worked, uh, I mean, I'm a computer scientist and engineer, but I've been inspired by uh, neuroscience for a very long time, although very, very sim simplistic neuroscience. Uh, but it's been extremely helpful in a lot of work I've, um, I've done. So uh, very simple ideas from neuroscience that have helped compu uh, computer science. And then uh, that's what I'm going to talk about at first, and then perhaps talk about perhaps the other way around if, uh, uh, if there is any possibility of that. Um, so one idea from computer science that has been extremely fruitful is the idea of hierarchy. <coughs> Uh, it's surprising how difficult it's been to convince people in computer science that hierarchical systems were, were, were good. And of course, we only have to look at the visual context to realize that vision is hierarchical in the brain. Uh, and there are good sort of uh, you know, semi-theoretical 
reasons or kind of at least hand wavy reasons uh, to justify the idea of, of hierarchy. But you know, a lot of people in neuroscience have had this idea for a long time that you know we assemble uh, local features into more complex motifs and into parts of objects and objects, etc. Um, uh, it's only in the last you know few years, couple of years even, that uh, the computer vision and machine learning community have realized the importance of this. Um, and, uh, and that comes from neuroscience, that comes also from psychophysics. Uh, of course, some people who were inspired by neuroscience have had this idea for a very long time, including uh, Fukushima with the Cognitron and, and myself since the late 80s. Um, and this is you know, rooted in, in uh, very classic work in uh, neuroscience, like you know, Visual Neuroscience 101, Google and Weasel. Um, and those things you know, are surprisingly powerful. They've been uh, you know, using the very simple idea of simple cells and complex cells and stacking them up and then coming up with some running algorithms to train them. Um, has been surprisingly uh, successful for things like handwriting recognition and simple visual tasks like face detection. Uh, but it's taken a while to apply this to real images. Um, and so there was kind of a sobering um, sort of humbling experiment that, that uh, we did in the mid-2000s uh, using the so-called Caltech 101 data set that Pietro Perona uh, actually put together where we used uh, one of those convolutional nets of the type we were using for handwriting recognition, and we trained it on the Caltech 101 data set. It was a small data set with uh, 101 categories of objects and 30 training samples per category, so very small. Uh, and it was essentially a complete failure uh, in the mid-2000 where people were getting on the order of 60% correct using state-of-the-art methods. Uh, a very kind of plain uh, convolutional net of the type we were using in the uh, early 90s was getting something like 30% correct. This is the uh, second line of the, the, the highlight, highlighted yellow line here labeled R plus R plus on the far right. Um, and we started playing with sort of architectural components, talking to our friends uh, across the street in the center of neuroscience at NYU, Eros Simoncelli, David Heger, and people like that, and, and you know, Bruno. Um, and, and we realized that if we replace the, the sigmoid we were using as a nonlinearity by a rectification, all of a sudden our performance uh, jumped by a factor of two. So instead of 30% correct, we we're getting 60% correct. Um, and, and then if we add divisive normalization, which people like David Higer had been advocating for a long time, uh, you know, you get a little bit of a boost. And then if you combine the two and you use a little bit of unsupervised learning, you get 65%. Of course, by the time we got this result, people using kind of more traditional engineering approaches to uh, computer vision got, you know, were in the 70s. And so we were kind of trailing behind. Uh, and of course, we knew it was because the data was too small. Uh, because when we tried those things on other data sets for which we had more data, like something like, like semantic segmentation, where here the game is to label every pixel with a category of the object it belongs to, this worked really well. We beat the record on this uh, uh, for you know, so a number of standard data sets uh, that people have been playing with. Um, and we submitted the papers to CVPR. It was soundly rejected. Um, even though the performance was better than everybody on three data sets, and uh, it was 100 times faster than the best competitor. Um, Basically, the reviews were, what is this convolutional net stuff? Um, and this was just three years ago. Um, so then two things happened. The ImageNet data set, uh, which was large enough to train very large uh, network networks, and then uh, fast GPUs, which allowed us to train those very large networks. Um, and uh, you know, our friends in Toronto kind of beat us to having a really fast implementation of this on GPU um, and got really good results uh, on the you know, one of the competitions. And so what the, 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 the kind of architectures that people arrived at were considerably deeper than we were using before. Many more layers, uh, much bigger networks, much higher resolution at the input, a lot more training. Um, at the time, uh, those, those first networks uh, came out, even on the fastest GPUs, at the time it would take about three weeks. And in the space of two, uh, less than two years, uh, now we can train those things in less than 48 hours. Um, so. The surprising thing about this, or some of the surprising things, at least for some people, not so much for people like me, we've been playing with these things for a long time, is that when you train them, you get very generic low-level features that look very much like you know, V1-like features. This is an example of a network that we trained on this ImageNet data set. And you get you know, oriented edge detectors, color contrasts, gratings of various kinds, uh, high-frequency filters, uh, uh, you know, blobs, center surround, things like this. If you increase the number of filters, you start seeing center surround in a larger, in a, you know, a, lar a large number of center surround and, and you know, more complex features. So the more features you put in, the more diversity you get and the, the more interesting they look. And this is purely supervised learning backprop. 
So an interesting phenomenon uh, happened after the first success of convolutional net in the ImageNet competition, which is that everybody in computer vision started to switch to using those models. So in 2012, there was one team using convolutional nets. In 2013, all but one, in fact, the one that was using something else also had a convolutional net. This was the Oxford team. And in 2014, basically all the top uh, teams and pretty much everybody else was using convolutional net. So there's been a bit of a revolution in, in computer vision uh, in the space of a few months, essentially, where everybody switched to using those models. And so th this is um, an interesting phenomenon. I mean, I've never seen this kind of fast switching to a completely new technique by an entire community in such a quick, quick amount of time, fast amount of time, short amount of time. It's, uh, it's, it's nothing short of uh, breathtaking. Um, in fact, uh, Ode, uh, maybe three years ago, organized a meeting at MIT together with uh, Alan Newell on the future of computer vision. And the title of my talk was, in front of the entire computer vision community, you were here, I think, yeah. uh, was uh, five years from now, all of you will be learning your features, you might as well start now. That was the title. Um, <laughs> I was wrong, it took three years. Um, and so, okay, so those things work really well. Uh, there's been tremendous progress uh, by uh, teams at uh, 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 Google in particular, NYU and various other places, uh, Berkeley as well, on detections, which includes you know, localization. Um, and at Facebook, we've been applying this to uh, face recognition with incredibly, incredibly good results, uh, you know, basically matching human performance on, on, on some, in some scenarios. There are other work that, uh, are now kind of expanding the application of those things to other visual tasks, uh, things like pose estimation, um, uh, things like that, where you can not only detect uh, people, but also figure out where all the limbs are. And that's using a convolutional net, basically, that's trained to detect heat maps of each of the limbs and then has some sort of you know, reasoning on top of it to figure out the, the consistent interpretation. Um, so the next thing, interesting thing that happened is now uh, Convolutional net is a big hammer that a lot of people are using for all kinds of different things. So not just for image recognition, and not just for um, uh, images for that matter, but for things like speech recognition. So a lot of speech recognition systems now use, uh, for the acoustic modeling part, use convolutional nets on the kind of time frequency representation. And the algorithms are the same as the one we use for images. It's just the data set is different. Um, the, uh, they are also used for natural language processing. And so there's a, a, a very, very active uh, a set of work now in natural language processing using convolutional nets and recurrent nets to do things like question answering system. This is some work by, uh, um, by Chisholm Weston at, uh, at, at Facebook. Um, and, and people are, are trying to solve the problem of uh, training neural nets that also have short-term memory in them. So there are a few ideas that have been floating around for a number of decades, uh, something called LSTM, long short-term memory, which is uh, a way to do this, and then in the last uh, year, there's been like three or four different new ideas on how to do this. You could think of this of as the recurrent net would be kind of like a cortex, and the uh, short-term memory would be kind of like a hippocampus. And you need this for those systems to work. And this short-term memory is, is used for the system to kind of remember things that happened far in the past, which is very difficult to store in kind of a you know, kind of reverberating state in a recurrent net, but if you have a, an associative memory on the side, it's much easier. So with this, you can do things like tell a story to a neural net, um, and the network can develop a representation of the, the state of the world, and then you can ask questions. So here is the very, very short version of uh, the three uh, volumes of Lord of the, Lord of the Rings that in, the, in the square here. Um, so if you haven't, it's a spoiler alert. If you haven't read Lord of the Rings, don't read this. It's all, <laughs> the, all the key events in Lord of the Rings are here. Um, and at the end, you can ask questions, you know, where is the ring, uh, where is Bibo now, et cetera. Um, and that works amazingly well. This is uh, an archive paper by Jason Weston, Sumitra Pra, and Twenbo. Is it's a, it's a recurrent net, which on the side has some sort of associative memory that you can write to and access. And it, it uses it to remember the state of the world, basically. But you can backpropagate gradient through it as well, so it's, that's a tricky. Okay, but okay, all of that is supervised learning. And we all know that uh, one of the things that uh, uh, really sort of impresses me by, uh, from, from, from uh, biological learning is the fact that we're not told the name of everything that we look at and we still can you know, derive the, a lot of information about the structure of the world and the dependency of, uh, you know, that the world is three-dimensional, that there is occlusions, that there is you know, the notion of object and background and things like this for vision. So how do we learn vision without being told the, uh, the name of every object? And we don't have a good solution for unsupervised learning. Many of us who got interested in uh, 
you know, we started the deep learning conspiracy about 10 years ago. Um, uh, started it because of kind of new advances that we thought we, we would bring uh, in the unsupervised learning. And it's been somewhat of a success and a, also a gigantic failure simultaneously in the sense that uh, we've come up with a lot of unsupervised learning algorithms like sparse autoencoders, restricted Boson machines, denoising autoencoders, and Yoshua has a list of, Yoshua Benjo has a list of, you know, 20 algorithms of this type. Um, a lot of it are inspired by, you know, also, uh, Bruno's, uh, you know, the Olsen field classical uh, work on sparse coding. Um, but the bad news is those things don't work as well as a purely supervised convolutional net trained on millions of samples. Uh, there's only a small number of applications where unsupervised learning actually helps at all. And so we don't think we have the answer, the ultimate answer for how you do unsupervised learning. But we have lots of really cool things to show about this. So this is a sparse autoencoder trained on natural image patches, which, you know, uh, when you leave, leave it to its old device, in the equivalent of a few minutes of training, of real-time training, would develop oriented edge detectors. Um, uh, so there the question is whether this is built into the genes or learned. You know, if it's learned, it could be learned in the first few minutes of life, you know, as soon as the eyes are active. Um, and then you can put some structure on it and get, you know, topo topographic maps uh, that look very much like V1. Um, this looks beautiful. If you put this in a vision system to do object recognition, it doesn't work as well as the thing that's purely supervised, and it's a lot slower. Um, and, you know, you can do the color coding like uh, you see in neuroscience papers, and it looks very much the same. Uh, you have those kind of pinwheel, uh, you know, patterns with singularities in the middle. There's another example. This is a different algorithm. This is yet another algorithm that uses lateral inhibition instead of explicit sparse coding. So we have like half a dozen algorithm sets, or even more, that do this kind of stuff. Uh, but, but we don't think they are the solution to the ultimate problem. Um, so the challenge is, I think, for, for us. So things that will, th things that, you know, we can get from neuroscience that will inspire um, uh, AI in general, and things from AI that perhaps could suggest experiments for, for neuroscience are things like, uh, how do we integrate feed, feedback and feed forward? So a lot of the systems that we use in practice right now are purely feed forward. When we use unsupervised learning, there is feedback, um, but we happily throw it away as soon as the system is, is trained. Um, but you know, it's clear that uh, feedback is necessary for a lot of complex tasks. Um, and, um, so you know, where does that come from? Um, how do we integrate supervised and unsupervised learning? I don't believe that uh, uh, animals and humans, that the brain has two different learning algorithms if you want for supervised and unsupervised. It's just kind of two facets of the same underlying uh, uh, method. And perhaps it's not just one method underlying it, there's maybe several. Um, but you know, how do we come up with sort of a unified supervised and unsupervised learning algorithm that actually works? We have such algorithms like Boson machines, but they don't work, or at least not well enough. Um, they have the right properties, except they don't work. All the right properties, <laughs> except they don't work. Um, um, how do we uh, integrate uh, deep learning or representation learning with reasoning? So right now, the, the successful systems like convolutional nets are kind of you know, reactive system. You put an input, you get an output, and that's the end of it. But there's, a, of course, a lot of things for which you need kind of change the reason, reasoning, planning for motor control, uh, for speech production, things like this, where you, know, you need to kind of, uh, you know, the system will have to sort of figure out how to uh, produce chains of, uh, of, of computation to arrive at something. And you know, people are working very actively on recurrent nets. Maybe that's part of the solution, but we don't think it's the ultimate answer either, certainly not with backpropagation. And by the way, backpropagation is certainly not uh, biologically plausible. So what kind of learning algorithm does the brain use? Uh, does it minimize the loss function? Does it use uh, a gradient estimation to minimize this loss function? If it uses a gradient estimation, what is it? Because it's not backprop. Um, and, um, and then there is the issue of short-term memory that I was telling you about earlier, for which there are kind of hints of solution, you know, practical solutions, but we don't know if they are relevant for biology. Um, and, uh, and of course, there is a huge gap in our theoretical understanding of uh, why those things work. This is uh, something Sanjeev was alluding to. Uh, there are sort of a lot more people who are, you know, on the, on the theor theoretical computer science and, and math side who are interested in this question now because of its practical importance. So I expect a lot of interesting things to happen there uh, in the near future. Thank you very much.
So, so the, it's actually more specifically to uh, uh, an application to convolutional nets rather than deep learning in general because of the pooling uh, operation. Right. And uh, I think it's going to take a while for the sort of deep learning community to digest this paper and really kind of get to the bottom of it. Uh, there <laughs> used to be a time when uh, you and I were in you know neighboring offices where uh, uh, statistical physicists or condensed matter physicists were very interested in in these kind of theoretical questions, and you were one of them. Um, and those people had disappeared, or, or they became, uh, uh, you know, neuroscientists, or went back to physics without worrying about these problems. And I think the the the, um, the success of deep learning is reattracting some of those people to those questions. And I think it's wonderful because there's a lot of techniques here that we need to learn from uh, from this community. Well, we can certainly use backpropagation through time. This is what uh, the technique people use to train recurrent nets at the moment for, you know, mostly for natural language processing applications. Um, the, uh, no, the main issue with uh, Boson machines, in my opinion, is the fact that uh, you have to use sampling. Uh, basically, uh, all of those me uh, methods, including sparse autoencoders and everything, are energy-based uh, methods, you know, very much uh, similar to, to, uh, to you know, the classic uh, work by, by Bruno. Um, and so when you have an energy function that is supposed to kind of capture the dependencies between variables, you want to make the energy or the, the energy low or the probability high on the data samples, you want to make the energy high or probability low outside. Yeah. Uh, if you have a normalized probability, probability model, that's easy. If you have a complex model that's intractable, it's very hard because you have to, you have a log partition function that's intractable. The second part is very hard. RBM solves it by sampling. And sampling is horribly inefficient. I don't believe the brain does sampling, basically. Um, but the brain has something that does plays the same role as sampling. So for example, uh, the Necker cube um, uh, effect is, is in an interesting uh, uh, phenomenon that, that shows that the brain has some built-in mechanism to explore multiple interpretations of a particular scene if it's ambiguous. Uh, and so it's got some exploration mechanism to kind of find multiple minima of an energy function of some kind. Um, and we don't know how it's, how it's done. It's, uh, it's certainly not sampling. It seems very regular. So, uh, so there's a d difference between the algorithm and then the model. You yes. think the model is fine? RBM? No, actually. No, okay. No. So th that's another problem. Because right? of symmetry and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Peter. So, segue. Yes, I'm also interested in vision and, um, and the long term goal of computer vision people, but also people who study computational vision in the context of a brain, is to understand how uh, one might analyze a scene. And so, here, uh, a list of objects, their positions is an obvious uh, question to ask, but then also uh, cause and effect relationships, what is moving, what is causing what to happen, etc. So there are lots of questions, and many of them are difficult to formalize to a point that we can measure them and we can understand how to pursue them. But I'm quite convinced, as Jack was pointing out, that the time of purely correlating brain activity with images is a bit over, and we need to put things in a loop where, where uh, some action is uh, performed because uh, unless the brain is in the loop of an action, we don't understand what what happens. And I think that in the context of scene analysis, maybe the simplest scenario is the one of visual search. And so here is something we are familiar with. And um, and so this man has to decide when to press some red button when he sees a, a knife into in a suitcase. Something that we ignore when we study computer vision and machine learning, but I think is very important when we move to the brain is the fact that not only error rates count, and so um, uh, Jan was showing to us tables with error rates, but <coughs> the brain really trades off two resources. One is error rates, and the other one is response time. And uh, in, um, in any scenario in which, uh, that I can think of, uh, time has a cost, and, uh, and uh, as we know, neurons fire uh, at some rate, and photons arrive on retina at some rate. And so information accumulates in the brain, and we don't wait until we have the perfect image before we decide. We decide as soon as we have enough information or we feel that we have enough information to decide. And there are different scenarios when the cost of time. So we could be picking apples and looking for red spots in a tree and we have to fill up our basket and then we go home for dinner. And so each uh, time wasted looking for apples is, is expensive for us in a linear way. But it, there could be also some very nonlinear uh, cost of time. Uh, so a feeding frenzy scenario in which so as soon as uh, a fish or a bird alights on the water, these crocodiles will uh, jump, but only one of them will get the fish. And so one millisecond advantage may mean the difference between getting uh, everything and, and getting nothing. And so <coughs> I think as we, um, as we think about the problem of perception, we have to take into account 
uh, this type of, uh, of constraints. So something that I have been interested in uh, recently is uh, trying to explain how visual search happens at the level of, of individual neurons uh, firing in the brain. And uh, I was ill-advised enough five years ago to assign this as a, a homework problem for a class I'm teaching that I inherited from John Hoffield at Caltech. And I was surprised that the students couldn't quite solve it. And then so I thought, OK, I'll, I'll write a solution set. And you know, a few years later, with a very bright graduate student, we're still in the middle of it. And I realize now that um, there are quite a few subtleties and interesting questions that go on. But anyway, we know we have characterized quite well what happens in, uh, in V1, primary visual cortex. And so we know that there are neurons that are tuned to orientation and various other image properties. And they will fire with approximately Poisson statistics more or less depending on how much they like the, the piece of stimulus they're able to see. And so how do you start from this set of neurons and trying to explain visual search without being able to know all the mechanisms in between? And so from <coughs> the computational standpoint, you have two crutches to, to use. Um, so the, one is the idea that uh, maybe biology is good enough that it can build optimal observers, the ones that will use all the information that is available in the firing rate of these neurons um, <coughs> in order to solve the task as well as possible, and therefore minimize simultaneously the response time and the error rates. And within the set of all possible mechanisms you could come up that are optimal observers, uh, the simplest mechanism should, of course, win the day. And by simplest, well, you have to use some knowledge about neuroscience in order to, to, be, uh, to select. <coughs> now, it turns out that um, for visual search in simplified conditions that psychophysicists study, uh, we have been able, and you know, there is a, a tradition, you know, uh, Mike Shatland starting with uh, discrimination, we do, with, um, we do search, but uh, uh, to, select, to, to, to compute optimal observers. And so there is a whole set of math that goes with it uh, that starts with Wald uh, 60 years ago. And uh, there are very interesting theoretical uh, questions that have to do with it, but <coughs> basically, uh, you can uh, derive a, what looks like a deep network. There are six layers, and there are two, um, two feedback loops for, to, to, for gain control and, and normalization that can predict um, somehow the activity of, uh, of neurons throughout this uh, chain. And these are all fictitious neurons. Of course, we don't know if they exist or not, but at least you can postulate them. And there's a hypothesis that can be tested in the lab. And throughout the network, there are signals that look like uh, log likelihood ratios um, and propagate through the network and they're aggregated in a, certain, in a certain way. And the beauty of this kind of models is that <coughs> there are very few free parameters that you need to fit. And so there are uh, propensity to risk, uh, there, are, there is the maximum firing rate of the neurons and, uh, and nothing more. And so I'll skip. But um, so the, the data you get from psychophysical experiments are very well fit by the model and um, crucially, for each one of the subjects we bring to the lab whose characteristics we measure, we can, we can predict what is the maximum firing rate of the neurons in their cortex. And so here, there is a subject around seven and some subjects between 10 and 20. And we can predict what is their uh, trade-off between the cost of time and the cost of errors as they carry out some experiments. And these are the three parameters. So once you have fit these parameters of the subjects, you can predict their performance in new tasks that you haven't experimented with and can verify whether the model has any predictive power. <coughs> so again, I would like to emphasize that here, each action potential is, is taken into account, and which I think is quite important. Now, this may have some repercussions in technology, and so I get into the question of can neuroscience feed back into uh, engineering and technology? And so <coughs> maybe pr these principles of networks of firing neurons that uh, propagate information in optimal ways, maybe they can be used for uh, building computer vision systems that are particularly power uh, economical with respect to the power. And so these are pictures from a paper by Toby Delbrook, who builds uh, event-driven um, retina. And so the, the retina is only going to fire whenever something moves in its field of view. And so where you see gray, there is no event. And there must be some contrast, and there must be some motion. And then the retina will fire. And so maybe. In the future, we'll see brain-inspired vision systems built out of spiking neurons. And those would be useful if we want to minimize the amount of power that is being used for the uh, unit bit computed from the, from the scene. And so first summary, and I'll, I'll quickly touch upon another topic in a moment. <coughs> um, so first of all, I believe that if we study perception and the brain in general, we need to 
uh, think about what is the brain trying to accomplish and um, check uh, our predictions against actually behaving systems like humans or animals. Uh, there is one more dimension that we should add to the current paradigm in machine learning and computer vision, which is the cost of time uh, to reach a decision. There is a possibility that if our theory gets good enough, we can account for individual action potentials, and maybe this will give us better engineered systems in the future. So the second topic I would like to talk about is related, and it has to do with uh, behavior. Yes. Okay. So yes, this slide. Um, <clears throat> so the point is that if we want to understand, so somebody earlier was asking are there data sets on behavior, and the, so I've been collaborating now with molecular biologists and geneticists in measuring the behavior of, of laboratory animals, and I've learned that behavior is very complex and it's influenced by genes, and so there's a whole question, can we measure behavior and can we make sense of it? And so I'll, so these are courtship in Drosophila, there are various actions, uh, these are fruit flies that explore. And so we can build tracking systems that can keep track of each individual animal for maybe half an hour. And so you can ask lots of very interesting questions in terms of what is if these flies learn, how is their interaction um, mediated by what they see, etc. And, and we are working towards building systems that can be trained quickly to track any um, animal in the lab so that our friends biologists can collect lots of data. And so at the moment we're able, for example, in mice to collect data for five days in a row <coughs> and, uh, and then analyze the data for behavior. And you can do, use the same systems for zebra fish, et cetera. And using these systems, you can build um, etograms, which are networks of behaviors uh, that change depending on, <coughs> on the genotype of the flies. And so this gives uh, our friends biologists something to work with. And there were some slides on unsupervised that I will skip. And so here is the second summary. <coughs> So there is a big question, which is how do genes affect brains and how do brains affect behavior? And I think that now we have uh, the means of, of having enough data on genes, enough data on brains, and finally enough data on behavior that we can do uh, analysis of this very interesting uh, uh, question. And so maybe I'll, I'll stop here um, and I'll take questions. Or in fact, I will not take questions because we're moving on, right? Uh, sure. I mean, yeah. uh, while we change speakers, yeah. you can, if somebody has a question. <laughs> Sorry, do you know, I, I passed you over. You, you were before Pietro, so go ahead. Oh, go now. Uh, so go before me. <laughs> so any questions for Pietro? Yes. Okay, so um, uh, we test subjects with fairly fast presentations and asking them to fixate in one point, and so we sidestep eye motions. But the, a key point <coughs> is that um, many effects that people believe are due to attention are in fact explainable completely by uh, signal-to-noise ratio arguments. And so, um, in fact, eye motions are um, a bit of a red herring right now, I think. All right. Uh, well, I had uh, five uh, topics I wanted to hone in on in, in terms of ways I think uh, that, uh, that neurobiology uh, can, uh, can give us powerful lessons about computation. Uh, but since uh, to try to keep the clock here, I think I'm just going to focus uh, on the first three. Uh, and then we can talk later at the breaks or whatever about the other ones if you're interested. Uh, so so uh, the first is what can we learn uh, about perception, the computations underlying perception uh, from tiny nervous systems? And uh, the reason why I think this is important uh, is because currently in neuroscience, uh, a lot of our efforts are, are uh, focused on um, trying to characterize human behavior and understand the neural basis of human behavior. But humans are incredibly complex organisms. Uh, our behavior is sometimes very difficult to characterize, uh, sometimes very strange. Uh, we do things like we fall in love and uh, end up engaging in incredi incredibly stupid behaviors uh, sometimes that are difficult to uh, explain. And uh, so, but another, I think, an, an more important reason is that uh, it's, it's very difficult to introspect about the important computations uh, that, uh, that, uh, that are going on inside our brains. So, um, and a lot of our, currently, a lot of our theories are, are, are motivated by introspections. And so, uh, I think what can sort of help, uh, help us get away from this uh, introspective <laughs> framework is by looking at uh, how perception is done in other animals, and in some cases, otherworldly animals. 
And, and so uh, one example, of the three, three examples I'll focus in in particular, the jumping spider, the sand wasp, and the, and the box jellyfish. Uh, so the jumping spider is a very interesting um, organism uh, because it has, uh, it has eight eyes. And as opposed to uh, other kinds of spiders, it, does not, it relies uh, mostly on its visual system to extend its sensory space and to capture, to capture prey. Uh, and so somehow its nervous system has to fuse the information together uh, from, from these eight eyes uh, and to form kind of a, mo a model of the world that can guide behavior. Uh, there's some, uh, been some, very recently, some incredibly uh, 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 some groundbreaking work done at Cornell University in the laboratory of Ron Hoy by Gil Menda. Uh, this, that just came out uh, where they were ap actually able to record from neurons in the brain of the jumping spiders. This has been a very technically uh, challenging, uh, challenging problem because the jumping spider's brain, uh, the, the hemolymph the is, is pressurized, so as soon as you make a hole in the brain, uh, it bleeds to death. Uh, and their solution was a very sophisticated one. Uh, a lot of people have talked about this over the years, whether you should try to build a, a pressure chamber of, of some kind to record from the brain. Uh, the solution was basically to make a very small hole uh, in, the, in the exoskeleton, uh, which, which uh, was very successful. So they, they've now been able to map out receptive fields within the jumping spider brain. So, so, the, so th this diagram here shows the eight eyes. These two ones in the front have extremely high resolution. So the resolution is on the order of 10 minutes of arc, which is about as good as a cat uh, and much better than a mouse. Uh, and so it, it, it grabs, in, uh, engages in incredibly complex uh, visual behaviors. It, it can do pattern recognition. It can recognize conspecifics for mating. Uh, it uses these eyes on the sides of, it head, uh, sides of its head to uh, detect motion and uh, to find prey. And it can also engage in uh, complex three-dimensional navigation. So it can basically survey a complex three-dimensional scene and do route planning uh, and so forth in the scene. So it's, it's really uh, it's capable of doing a lot. And it, it's doing all of this with uh, uh, on the order of, of about probably 100,000 neurons or so in its entire visual system. So it's basically the equivalent of one hypercolumn of uh, visual cortex in the, in, in the, in the, in the mammal uh, that, it, that it's doing all this um, incredibly computa incredible computation. So uh, if I had a connectomics uh, machine, that, this is where I would aim it. I think there's a lot of valuable lessons that we could gain from teasing apart the neuroanatomy of the system together with the neurophysiology now with this groundbreaking work from uh, Ron Hoy's lab. And, uh, the, uh, the other w one, one example I would like to point out, because the brain is so small, the, the, so these, these two eyes in the front, they actually move back and forth. Those tubes uh, scan back and forth. The, the, re the retina is a one-dimensional strip of photoreceptors that scans back and forth. Uh, there's six, six muscles that uh, control that motion, both translation and rotation. And for each muscle, there's just one neuron that's driving it. So this makes the task of sort of you know, backing out the wiring of the system and trying to do, do, do these computations from, from the wiring, I think there, there's, a, there's a lot you could, you could so gain there. Do you project different eyes to different eyes? I'm sorry? Do you project all the eyes to different, different eyes? To they have different ganglia, they have each behind it, but eventually they fuse. Uh, they all come together into the brain. They fuse and they come together. At, at a later stage, yeah. But initially, they only have each their own, their own private ganglia uh, for, for processing. Another example is the sand wasp. Um, so this, this animal does not have particularly good high resolution because it has a compound eye, but it uses its visual system for, uh, for navigation. Uh, it, can, it can hunt for bees as far as a mile away from its nest and find its way back to its nest, which is a hole in the sand. Uh, and it's, so, so it's doing very, comp very um, a complex three-dimensional uh, recognition of the environment. Uh, also, there's another species of, sand, uh, of wasp, not sand wasp, but a, another species of wasp, which engages in uh, face recognition. And so this face recognition ability of, uh, this, of this particular species of wasp uh, is extremely important to how they organize their colony. They have, a, they have a hierarchy, a dominance hierarchy in the colony that dictates who does what tasks and, and which keeps the colony organized. And so the ability to recognize faces, these, these very sort of, more <coughs> these, these differences in the facial markings, um, they can actually recognize individually. And they, they have memories for faces that, that um, over the course of a week, even when they've learned other faces in the, in the, in the meantime. So this is really, really astonishing capabilities. Again, it being done in a very, very small brain. So I think there's a lot that connectomics could teach us, together with physiology, uh, about uh, the complex processing in these brains. The box jellyfish is even more astonishing because it doesn't even have a brain. Uh, all it has is a ring of neurons that connect uh, these different eyes together. Uh, um, so it has 24 eyes in total. And, uh, and so some of these eyes have perfect optics. So it's not like they're just primitive eyes that are getting a very blurry the uh, image of the world. Uh, they have st they ha they're the eyes that have been extremely well engineered and are practically aberration free. This is a recent discovery from um, Dan Nielsen's lab. And it's been shown that they use the visual system basically to navigate within the riverbanks about where to, um, where to find prey. So I think there's a, a lot of viable lessons I think we, we can gain about behavior 
uh, behaviors that sort of lie be beneath our, 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 our zone of introspection, uh, which are incredibly, incredibly important computations that we, that we don't often think about explicitly. And this is just a really beautiful quote from Rod Brooks, someone who I don't normally agree with, uh, but, uh, but this is something I, 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 I really resonate with a lot. What he's basically pointing out here is that these things we tend to focus on, like you know, language, expert knowledge, and reason, and so forth, you know, sort of some of the goals of AI, uh, they're actually pretty simple once the essence of being and reaching are available. That essence is the ability to move around in a dynamic environment, sensing the surroundings to a degree sufficient to achieve the necessary maintenance of life and reproduction. This part of intelligence is where evolution has concentrated its time. It is much harder. So, so he's saying these, these, these are some of the really, the really um, difficult focuses, uh, problems to focus on, things we don't even think about because they're just so automatic and so simple to us. Uh, so another area, I think, where we can gain a lot of insights about, about computation uh, is in studying the properties of individual neurons, the computational properties of individual neurons. So oftentimes in our, in our mo computational models of, of the cortex, uh, we, we use these perceptron units, or McCullough-Pitts neurons. These are models of neurons which were invented about 50 years ago, uh, which assume essentially that what a neuron does is it sums its inputs together, and then the nonlinearity is applied at the soma, like a thresholding nonlinearity, and, and, and an action potential comes out of the neuron. And if, anything, if there's anything we know that neurons are not doing, it's that. So, we, so neurons are actually uh, uh, highly nonlinear devices which are, which are doing non, uh, local nonlinear computations on the dendrites. So the idea, so this is something that's uh, been, been proposed by um, and promoted by Bartlett Mel for a long time, what he called uh, originally sigma pi units, uh, the, in other words, a sum of products, but now there's a lot of uh, neurophysiological support for that uh, when, in, when, in, when inputs combine uh, on a dendritic tree, it matters tremendously where those inputs come into. So when they come in together on a neighboring part, of, uh, on a neighboring branch, then they'll have like an and-like combination or a, a, or, or a, a veto kind of inhibition sometimes, for, for example, due to shunting inhibition. So it's all these nonlinear effects where these signals interact nonlinear on the, nonlinearly on the dendritic tree. So, uh, so I think it's really astonishing at this point in, in the year 2014 that uh, we still don't understand, we still don't have a good computational model of a single neuron, right? It was, so if, if you sort of pull people in the community, you would get answers that it's anywhere between uh, a glorified OR gate or summing junction to an entire Pentium computer. And it can be sort of anywhere in between them. And I think so just uh, really sort of carefully characterizing the computational properties of single neurons and what they can do. And then especially what they do when you connect them together in circuits um, is, is going to be a very valuable enterprise. Uh, uh, they're much more co powerful computational devices than, than we've been assuming in our model. Uh, and so another example of, of, of this, the power of local dendritic computation uh, is, uh, is uh, neurons such as amacrine cells in, in the retina. Uh, all the computation in amacrine cells is, is usually done in the dendrites. So one example of that is the starburst amacrine cell. This is one of the great successes, I think, of connectomics combined with physiology, is they're beginning to figure out how the starburst amacrine cell computes emotion in the retina. And basically, all the computation is done by a traveling wave that's going through these dendrites. And, and the signals are coming into the dendrite and out of the dendrite. So the dendrite has both inside input processes and output processes. It doesn't have to go through the soma. So you can record from the soma of an amacrine cell, such as the starburst amacrine cell, and it won't tell you anything about what the computation is actually going on in the neurons. Because in a lot of these amacrine cells, the soma is electrotonically isolated from the dendrites where all the computation is occurring. This is also the, w the way a lot of the information processing is done in, um, in insects, by the way. Uh, and so finally, this, this, th this third one, um, is, is what's, what's, what, are, what are these highly sparse, uh, overcomplete representations being used for in, 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 in the system? So this is one example that Horace Barlow uh, drew, sketched out from a cross-section of a nissel stain of layer four of V1 many years ago. Uh, the red dots at the top show the spacing of the geniculate afferents. That is the <coughs> input fibers coming in from the LGN. So these are kind of like you know, the pixels, if you will, coming into um, a, a, chunk of, a chunk of V1. So as you can see, there's very few uh, inputs compa compared to the number of neurons that are receiving that information. So if there's anything we can say that this system is not doing, it's not doing a dimensionality reduction in, in sort of the traditional uh, sort of linear re uh, re dimensionality reductions. And it's not, it's not a bottleneck. If anything, it's doing dimensionality expansion. And the nature of this dimensionality expansion is that the representations become very sparse. The representations coming in from the LGN tend to be very dense, lots of high, fairly high firing rates in the, on the order of 20 spikes per second. And when they fan out and, and form this high, high dimensional representation, the firing rates go down to about one spike per second. So it goes, to, it goes into a very sparse code in this very high dimensional space. And again, this is not something that's just happening in visual cortex. Um, it happens, for example, in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, in the granule cell layer of the, of the cerebellum, and probably many others as well. So it's something that's happening over and over again in the brain 
and I think it's, t it's teaching, it's telling us something very, very important about um, how brains compute um, that, that we could use in, in computational models. Okay, so I'll, I'll end there because I'm going to talk for a short time. Uh, let's work there. That's layer 4C. Uh, by the way, that, that's, just, that's just being honed in on there as an overcomplete representation is because it is a fairly homogeneous population. So we're, we're not sort of just saying all of cortex is overcomplete. Is this just the particular input layer? Now there might be sort of a whole bunch of heterogeneity within that cell population within layer 4C that we still don't know about. Then it's sort of unfair to just call that one big overcomplete gamish, right? It might be um, sort of different subpopulations and they're doing different things. But, but still, I think that, that's been incredibly important to tease out yeah. in, in that case. Um, so I'm interested in uh, how the brain computes, what actual computations are going on in the brain, but I'll have another go later this evening, so I don't want to spend my time uh, talking about that. So I just want to touch briefly on a question which has been raised already, which I've always wondered about, and so have people who just wandered wander in from the street, from who haven't been to neuroscience meetings before, is um, you know what exactly is the connection between theory and experiment in, in this field? Are there theoretical predictions which have been useful? Um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so it occurred to me that uh, in this field there's no kind of accepted narratives, narrative of success stories. So, if, so I presume in, in the physics community there's some accepted narratives that there was the <coughs> ether, the Michelson-Morley experiment, Einstein, Einstein, measuring something about the orbit of Mercury, and everyone understands the interaction, interaction between uh, theory and experiment. But in uh, um, but in this field, there seems to be very little uh, consensus narrative. You know, people just you know, or walk around with, with, with different views. Um, I think one could make up narratives of things like about the perceptron. I think the perceptron is a very, very important theoretical thing, which has, has had uh, predictive power on experiments. Um, but uh, so I just want to mention an even earlier story, which, which I heard. So I heard this story from uh, Manuel Blum, who's a computer scientist, well known to many people here. So he, um, he was an uh, undergraduate at MIT in the 50s, studying electrical engineering, and he, he was also interested in the brain. And he worked in the lab of uh, Warren McCullough, who was uh, co-author of this famous, of the, of the um, original uh, neural net paper, uh, McCullough and Pitts in 1943. So um, this story is basically uh, Manuel Blum's recollection of Warren McCullough's uh, viewpoint. Um, so, uh, so this, so, so the, uh, so the, what, so the, McCullough Pitts paper gives a, a neural net, net model, and they very um, put emphasis on the fact that this model is universal for Turing machines, as long as, as you add some unlimited tape, and uh, this may be the first paper where Turing is is referenced outside from the immediate logic field where he came from. <coughs> Um, but uh, McCullough also observed that to get his, his simulation of Turing machines going, you, you needed some inhibition. So you needed some, uh, act, uh, some element being active caused another element to be less active. And at the time, um, apparently, you know, all, all the synapses were believed to be uh, in, uh, excitatory. There had been no inhibitory synapses observ observed at the time. So McCullough predicted there were going to be inhibitory uh, synapses. Um, and um, eventually they were discovered, and uh, of course are very important, but then when they were discovered, uh, no one said that uh, Warren McCullough had predicted this, so he was <laughs> a bit upset. Um, so, um, okay, so, so I think that, that's, uh, uh, I think, a worthwhile story. Um, now, the, 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 I don't want to make the, to anyone to leave with the idea that it's very easy to make predictions. It's so easy to make predictions and then they either come true or not. I mean, many things are hard to predict. So, for example, uh, or impossible to predict. So, for example, there's a lot of discussion of, of, of uh, deep networks. Um, so, deep, deep networks were certainly not predicted by theory. They were just an experimental finding uh, back in the 50s. That we know that uh, uh, anima vision systems in animals have um, deep networks. And even now, we wouldn't know how to predict it because uh, we don't have any, any good reason why they're better than shadow networks, for example. <laughs> um, so, uh, so the places where theory can make uh, uh, sharp predictions, I think, is, is few, um, but uh, maybe um, that they're worth uh, looking for and taking uh, notice of. Okay, thank you. So, Anne, how are we doing on time? I know we started a little late. Can we just start a little late, like 10 minutes for the questions? Okay. <laughs>
So, all right, I'll please try to make the questions brief and uh, similarly for the answers so we can have a few questions. There's one over there. Yeah, so just uh, notice this contrast between uh, the emphasis placed here on the uh, computational mechanisms and the ones from the previous panel which you know, brought up this uh, whole uh, notion of uncertainty, that handling uncertainty is really essential if you're building you know, the uh, systems that control a body and, and interacting with the real world and so on. So I'm wondering if uh, you have thoughts on whether as you extend some of these models, like for example deep networks, to include planning, reasoning, and motor control, are there ways to incorporate um, you know, uh, models of uncertainty, handling uncertainty, and so on? Yeah, so a lot of the, uh, a lot of the models that as I was referring to before, um, the models of, of reasoning are based on this idea of uh, energy-based models, energy minimization. <coughs> and you could think of energy as log probability if you want. <coughs> uh, the, the difference is that you don't have to carry all the baggage of you know, probability distributions that have to be normalized, which, turn, you know, which is a very kind of difficult computational and technical problem, mathematical problem. Uh, so if, if, you're, if the purpose of an organism is to make decisions, uh, in the end, it's going to make one decision. The, the fact that uh, you know, if you're faced with an obstacle, you're going to keep going with probability 0.1 and turn with probability 0.9 is irrelevant. You're going to have to make a decision. And so in the end, you're not, you're not manipulating probabilities. In internally, of course, you might, the system might have to consider multiple interpretations, and those will have to be scored. Uh, and uh, if you want to merge the decisions of multiple systems that will be trained separately, you need to calibrate those scores and the best way to calibrate scores is to use probabilities. But, but if there is no calibration to do because the whole <coughs> system is trained at once, then you don't need probabilities, you just need scores. Yeah, so just as a follow up, uh, I mean, we, we talked about the Necker cube phenomenon, which right. has some notion of sampling there. And there is, it's not just a uh, single answer that you give as a classifier gives an answer. So how would you explain those types of phenomena? Well, so the point I was trying to make is that it doesn't look like sampling. It looks more like a systematic exploration of multiple uh, interpretations, which you can think of as, you know, <coughs> minima of an energy function. Uh, but it doesn't look like, you know, a Mokoshi Monte Carlo sampling because the, the switching between the two interpretations of the Necker cube is very regular. You know, it's every five seconds. I mean, it varies by people, but it's very regular. So yeah. there's got to be some sort of built-in mechanism for this, you know. And there have been models that have been proposed for this from the, from the mathematical side, uh, point of view by Max Welling, you know, like, uh, herding and things like this, which are sort of ways <coughs> to do sampling in a deterministic way that really don't appeal to probabilities, actually. Yeah, I mean, for instance, also Bruno's work, right? I mean, energy minimization, you can think of it as probabilistic, but... Yeah. Of, of course, I need to speak up in, in favor of <laughs> uncertainty. So, uh, 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 Jan, there, there, there's, there's a situation where you want to generalize, where I do one task in one situation, say, with my arm, and then we change the risk structure. Maybe mm. now I want to, now if I make sudden errors, it will be very costly for me. In that case, it is actually important for me to understand the whole probability distribution. Those kinds of generalization experiments people have done, and we, we have at least appear to be able to carry over aspects of probability distributions to new situations. Right, so if you have situations where, uh, y uh, you know, it's, you basically are forced to use something like Bayesian decision theory because uh, because your cost function might change from from one instance to the next. Then then of course the underlying thing you need to manipulate is very much like a probability distribution. Yeah, but uh, <coughs> but the point is it doesn't actually have to be a normalized probability distribution. It could be a bunch of scores, right? It's uh, as long as it's consistent. Yeah. I uh, so I disagree on uh, on this. I think that so a key aspect I think for uh, biological systems is that they not only they decide what to do but also when to do it and they decide when to do it when they have enough information to optimize some some cost or expected reward and we see that in the lab a lot when we work with humans so I believe that s there is a representation that may be not probability maybe akin to probability I don't believe that there is base in our brain that is set in parameters but evolution has probably given us uh, <coughs> enough um, uh, signals that we can, uh, that we pr proxies of probabilities that we compute, and when these probabilities reach a, enough, uh, a, a high enough level, then we act um, uh, accordingly. And so, I, so the fact that we, it is very difficult to push through the equations with probabilities doesn't mean that um, there may not be probabilities there, it's just that we don't know how to handle them yet. And so, you know, it's just a matter of being patient and doing things right, and then we <coughs> will get that. 
uh, under control. Well, I certainly have nothing to say against the idea of manipulating, a cer manipulating uncertainty, but uh, the point I'm making is that you know it doesn't have to be calibrated probabilities; it's just scores. And another question. I wanted to ask if, if there is a natural <laughs> way to manipulate or change the deep network to become a controller. Well, so that's act. essentially what, uh, I mean, there's been a lot of work on this in the 90s. In fact, uh, a lot of the branch of neural nets that is sort of part of electrical engineering res rather than computer science <coughs> is concerned with using nonlinear controllers, neural nets as nonlinear controllers. Um, but there's, um, there's, there's more recent work in that direction, mostly directed at things like um, uh, language translation. So you could think of language production as a control problem, as a planning problem. Uh, you know, how do you generate a sequence? Uh, you know, it's a sequence of symbols, but you can think of it as a sequence of actions uh, that produce a particular result or a particular meaning in that case. Uh, and so, so the problem of <coughs> producing uh, sentences, producing programs, and producing sequences of actions are very similar, and people are, are using uh, a combination of uh, recurrent nets and what I would call uh, reverse convolutional nets, so these are, or reverse TDNN if you want. So these are uh, models that go back to things that people were doing they're in the They're very different than the deep network. I no, was no, wondering. they're not different. They, they are, I mean, they're, the, the, the details of the architecture is, are different in the sense that, for example, if, I, if there is a code for a particular trajectory, uh, and uh, and I want to you know run it through uh, a network that's going to generate the trajectory, the muscle controls, for example, or the motor controls. Uh, then it has to do the reverse of what a conventional net would do. It has to oversample in time, right? It has to transform kind of an instantaneous vector into uh, a sequence over time. And you could think of this as uh, you know oversampling in time through through layers to generate that sequence, or you could do it with a recurrent net, with, and it has you know different properties. And so people are playing with this, yeah. Uh, also in the context of time series prediction and things of that type. Question. Yes. Uh, somewhat as a small elaboration on the last question is, is not only generating controllers, but I think what seems to be more critical is the ability to generate sub-goals that can become live of their own lives in different contexts. I mean, I think that that seems to be the most promising uh, yeah, absolutely. Idea. So, so how do you have how do you generate the the similar hierarchies that we have for perception, from low level features to mid level features, etc. For control, you would have to do the inverse, right? Some high level specification of uh, a control, and then an instantiation of this with you know slightly more details, and then a more you know instantiation of this with more detail, perhaps informed by perception. I think the most interesting work I know about in, uh, that attempts to solve this with sort of neural nets, if you want, is uh, uh, is the PhD thesis of uh, Greg Wayne, who is a student with Larry Abbott. Mm -hmm. And he just published a paper in Neural Computation about this, which I think is, is very interesting. I was on his uh, thesis committee, and uh, he spent time in my lab, and I think it's, uh, it's really cool. Because I think one, one of the key possible definition of an intelligent uh, agent is some, something that can generate its own goals, essentially. That's right. It uh, doesn't right. need to be uh, so simply a controller of some goal. Uh, I absolutely outside. agree. So there's actually quite a bit of work uh, at, uh, at at Facebook on, on this, on uh, essentially you know training machines to produce uh, programs or sentences or things like this, which are kind of complex <coughs> sequences of actions. Uh, it's, it's a pretty pretty hard nut to crack, but very interesting one. Yeah, just uh, just adding something. And, and, and oh, just, so any non-neural net questions? Just checking. I, I I love neural nets too, so that's fine. We can go back. You already asked a question. Is anybody else there? <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Oh, Santosh has a new question. Yeah, um, I'll repeat your question if you. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, yeah. you can pause. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Shafi mentioned uh, uh, property testing as one area where uh, potentially computer science has methods that could scale to large graphs or brain graphs and so on. I was wondering if uh, perhaps. Uh, could discuss some other topics such as streaming algorithms, sketching, or more generally the use of randomness. Um, that could be relevant to to brain graphs or even to understanding. So, so Santosh is referring to these uh, mode of algorithm design, for instance, streaming algorithms. You just make one pass over the data. If the data is so large 
that you just make one pass over it and you can still amazingly enough compute some interesting things. No, that's, that's you know, good point. I, I, I guess I was, uh, the reason I, I was focusing especially on that is because from the talk, uh, they, they actually store the data. So what they do collect, they do store it. Just, but they don't, just to see what I'm saying, so they don't, um, it doesn't seem like to be the best bottleneck. Uh, it's just that they, there's so much I see. Uh, for for taking into collecting that they just collect part of it. But what they do collect, they keep store. So I don't know that streaming necessarily can help you. Uh, I was thinking more about what the brain might be doing, things that are relevant to oh, it. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay, uh, I got the signal to, uh, to uh, finish this panel, but uh, feel free to ask your questions during the next break. So thank you very much.